Okay, we're back. Hopefully I've got more composure. This is where Paul, uh, Peter begins quoting Paul in Ephesians 1.3, but in his meter he's tracking later. This is 140, okay? In Paul's meter, see this is, meter acts as a kind of concordance, a cross-reference system, because everybody memorized by syllable counts. Okay, so this is where it is in Paul. Okay, but that was Paul's, you know, count from his verse 3. But he's at 140 right here. Now, this is extremely sophisticated, so you're going to have to read it if, you're, if God even wants you to do that. Peter is tagging Paul right here. This is the same methodology that Daniel used to tag Isaiah, that Isaiah used to tag Psalm 90, that Mary used to tag Daniel, and that Paul used to tag Mary. They do it by syllable counts. <clears throat> so when Peter reaches 140, he means you to look at this part of Ephesians 1, which is actually in verse 6, but pregnantly it's talking about the time of the Bar Kokhba, what would become known, because it wasn't then known, as the Bar Kokhba rebellion, which would result in the total destruction of Jerusalem. That's why it's important to what Peter's talking about. He's warning that, yes, it's about to happen. See, that's why when you see Peter talk in 2 Peter about the Lord is not slow, as some count slow, slow, slowness, now you understand why he was so vitriolic. Because the meter was real specific about the timing. And all those scoffers are saying, where is his promise? Well, that means they didn't bother to read the meter, okay, just like we don't. Paul is explaining, hi, this is Bar Kokhba going to come up here. The temple is going down completely, okay. I mean, it was already destroyed, but even Jerusalem with it on a 140-year timeline, hello, from Christ, from his birth. And that's supposed to remind you of the 140 years okay that it took from the time the temple went down to the time jerusalem was rebuilt it's a deliberate 140 year parallel in reverse i don't know if god can make it any more obvious to people who memorize scripture by counting syllables they index their scripture they cross-reference their scripture they memorize their scripture by syllable counts they still do that today, okay? So this shouldn't be too hard to verify. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, inferring it from looking at the construction of the meter and knowing the fact that, yeah, people did memorize scripture in those days. Okay, well, you know, people count syllables now. They count the syllables in the words in order to copy the Torah. Hello, this isn't too hard to understand especially when it's bald like this. Okay, but here's the point. Paul does some very sophisticated um, nested anaphora, and this is the beginning of the apinon anaphora in Paul. There's the apinon and the eudokion, and then the, what I call the temple trio anaphora, which uses uh, proetito, um, protithemi, and... Um, Picotas. Okay, I go through that in the Ephesians 1 read parse docs, you'll have to read it. It's ex it, it'll boggle your mind how sophisticated this is. All right, so Peter knows. This is why I'm crying. I'm getting confirmation that Peter knew what I already wrote out. And you know how when you work on something and you, you've done all the testing you can and you're sure what you're saying is true, but you don't have any independent confirmation. Okay, well, the, this is independent confirmation for me. And that's why I'm crying. I, I'm sorry, but, you know, I've worked on this for years now. And here I find confirmation in Peter, and I don't even like the Petrine epistles. You know, shame on me, okay? That's my fault for being so, you know, prejudiced. I, I've never liked the Petrine epistles because they're so syrupy. Well, but syrupy is how the meter text gets done. 
It's syrupy on the surface with a whole bunch of detail that's very satirical and pointed underneath, if you know the meter. And so here is Peter proving that what I thought Ephesians meant, yeah, hello, see, he's doing the same thing. So I'm dying inside. And it's sort of a comeuppance, too, because I didn't like parsing Daniel 9. I didn't like doing the meter in Ephesians, and I don't like doing the meter in Peter. Well, guess what? See, so it's kind of a like a dig at me. See, brain out. You didn't like doing this, but look how I blessed you. Yeah, and I shouldn't be blessed. I should be killed. But I can't afford to feel sorry for myself, okay? Just keep back at the subject and the subject is sorry the machine is so slow because Ephesians is a very long document the subject is this part of Ephesians which tells us how to interpret Peter 133 to 140 AD alright so knowing that I wonder how long I can go back and forth between these documents before the video tanks. See how slow it is to change? Because it doesn't like that much in memory. All right, so what are we to discern? He quotes Ephesians 1.3. So he's drawing parallel to Ephesians 1.3 as to the character of the time, which was the first 14, you know, this part here is A.D. 14 in Paul's meter. He's playing on Augustus' death. Okay, because Christ was born, you know, at the beginning, because he's starting zero or one one A.D. He's starting at zero. He's doing his own anno domini. So when Christ was 14 years old, Augustus dies. Okay, that's the play here. By the time he's a man, 20 A.D. All right, our boy um, Tiberius had been in office for like five years, okay? This is when you were eligible for military service in, under the law. So that's why it's poignant. All right, so what is Peter telling us? Okay, that according to his great mercy, okay, we are, we are rebirthed to a living hope due to the resurrection, it's real important, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now that was really clever phrase. He could have said we're born to a living hope because of his death, because of his payment on the cross. That's what Paul is doing. But Peter substitutes and stresses instead the resurrection, which indeed is the victory that's God. The resurrection means that God pronounced Christ's work efficacious. Okay, that's why he's resurrected. Okay, but now look at the time that's being referenced. The temple is down in 140. A pig temple was resurrected on top of, not the Jewish temple. A Gentile pig temple. The whole Jewish city was raised and Aeolia Capitolina was built on top of it. The Jews weren't even allowed in the city except on 9th Ave which they call Tishba'av today, okay? They weren't even allowed in. It's a Gentile temple. Yeah, and what is God doing during this time? Building a temple out of Gentiles. Do you see the wit here? And he's sticking to the temple theme. Can somebody please kill me? Because it, this is so bald. And yet the wording is so syrupy on the surface. To a living hope due to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead ones. How many pastors have said that in their sermons? Totally oblivious to the satirical meaning of this. The resurrected temple. The resurrected temple. The temple that's resurrected by 140 AD is a pig temple. By Gentiles. Signifying what? Israel's apostate. She's gone down under. Church is now being built. 
the Temple of Church, Ephesians 2, Second Wall, Second Covenant, New Temple, signified by Pig Temple. Could Peter be more sarcastic and wry? And could this be a greater blessing to know? Yeah, it's a living hope. Living Hope because the pig temple's there now, built by Gentiles. And by the way, this is church, which is calling out of the Gentiles. And any Jew can now become a part of church by believing in Messiah, just like any Gentile could have become a Jew prior to church by believing in Messiah prior to church. So now the Gentiles are being used to save the Jews like the Jews were being used to save the Gentiles. Let's return the favor to the Jews because Christ is Jewish. Do you get the wit? Could it be more witty than this? Tell me how. Okay, so now to close out, let's go back to, if my will permit it. Oh, please don't die at me, machine. I'm sorry this takes so slow. So now we go back to what Paul was saying about the same thing. Epinon. Epinon doxis tes karitos out to see they're both talking about grace. Okay? But Paul is talking about foreordination. Peter's talking about the foreknowledge and the resurrection. Okay, Paul's just talking about our placement as a result. He's not specifically mentioning resurrection, but of course, there's a resurrected pig temple at the time of this section. Now, the Apinon anaphora is extremely complicated. So I really, I'm going to have to ask you to read that so when you look up I'm afraid I'm going to lose this um, in the table of contents here you've got the anaphora here's the apinon anaphora okay and it starts on page 46 but it really ends up going all the way through okay that's page 46 of 150 that's where you get introduced to the overview of what the Apinon anaphora is. It's really complicated, guys. I'm sorry I can't dumb this down. Okay. Oh, I am so afraid I'm going to lose this. Okay, my back button isn't suddenly going to work. you got to look up Paul's chrono chart. Okay. You're going to have to look this up, and you're going to have to pay attention to the anaphora um, in the appendix. See, appendix one on anaphora timelines, that's what you're going to have to look at to see the dire importance of the 231 and the 140 in Peter. i got to stop now because the machine seems to be dying.